All right, in this example, note that we've got a homogeneous cross-section and a material that's constant. The problem is, that makes this different, is that we have an applied torque that builds up all the way along the length, kind of like a distributed load for a beam. And that's what makes it a non-uniform kind of situation. We have to handle it just a little bit differently. Now, overall, this is actually a pretty straightforward problem. We've got fixed end at one end, free on the other. We have constant lots of things. And for reasons you're going to see readily here in just a moment, it's probably advantageous for us to flip the fixed end, call positive, go into the right. The torque is now going the other way, so we're kind of looking at it from this other side. <coughs> it's going to make the assignment of the model here a little bit easier. So, for instance, when we draw the torque diagram, and we have this buildup of the applied torque at some length x, Then <coughs> we've got all this applied torque, so on and so forth. Right? And we've got our right outward normal, our t, as a function of x. And that's just going to be equal to a plus 5x, right? where the 5 has units of pound feet per foot or pound inches per inches if we wanted to. Actually, it could be pound meters per meter, although that'd be very strange. But of course, these dimensions are <coughs> canceling out here. Right, so um, that's what why I want to do it this way. It makes it really easy. When x is zero, the internal torque is zero. When it's out here at 12 foot, the max will be uh, internal torque of, of 60 pound feet. Right now, note what we're asked for: find the maximum shear stress in the cross section in the total angle of twist. Right, so <coughs> our basic model for shear stress then is if we are in the elastic range, tau equals t rho over j. Right? And so tau max then is evaluated at rho equal to c, that outer fiber. And so that maximum, again, will be over here at that far right. So that would be 60 pound feet of torque <coughs> times an outer radius which is 0.875 inches divided by 2, because that's the diameter. And then we'll divide by our J. Well, we've got a pipe here. So we've got pi over 2, and then the outer diameter divided by 2 raised to the fourth, minus, then we've got to get the inner diameter. And so that's the outer diameter minus 2 of the wall thickness. Divide that by 2 to get the radius and take that to the fourth power. And if you work this out in steps, notice we have pound feet times uh, inches. So let's convert that feet into inches right off the bat. So we'll have 60 times 0.875 divided by 2 times 12. We'll have 315 pound inch squared in the numerator. And then we've got inches to the fourth in the denominator. When we work this all out, we'll find out this new denominator. Find out that's about 8.69 tenths time, 10 to the minus third pi inches to the fourth. And then when we do that calculation, we'll get 11,538 psi pounds per square inch over inches to the fourth will give us psi, or approximately 11.5 ksi. And that is <coughs> less than the yield, which equaled 30 ksi. So that's an elastically responding system. So that was pretty straightforward, really. It's not anything particularly different. We just had to go, um, in this case, by observation, figure out where the max tau was, or max torque was. And because j <coughs> and c were constant, along the length, we just went to the fixed end to find that maximum uh, shear stress. Now, for the angle of twist, though, this is a little bit more complex because we do have this variable amount of internal torque all the way along the length. So there, since we know that we're assured of elastic behavior, to find our phi, we're going to have to do incremental analysis. We're going to have to add up 
all of the incremental rotations along the length. <coughs> now remember our basic model that we have here is phi equals TL over JG when all these three things are constant along this length. But if you look at that rate, d phi would be equal to T times DX over JG. Right? And so there then we can put in our function for our internal torque times DX over JG. JG J and G are constant for us. And so J, <coughs> our second, or a, rather a polar moment of inertia, is 8.69 times 10 to the minus third pi inches to the fourth. G is 7,000 KSI. <coughs> and then we'll integrate, well, T of X is equal to 5X times DX. And we're going to go from zero starting point to the end, which is 12 feet. Now, 12 feet is also 144 inches, which I think is going to be a lot more convenient for us here as we go along. And so, emphasize that, inches. And so now we've got 7,000 times 8.69 E3 minus. That equals times then pi. That's 191.1. And that would be kip inch squared in the denominator. And then here we get 5x squared over 2 evaluated from 0 to 144. Now remember, the 5 is units of either pound feet per feet, but that's the same thing as 5 pound inches per inch. So since we've got this in here, we're going to get <coughs> something kind of interesting here. We got kip inch squared in the denominator. We're going to have pounds in the numerator. So we're going to have to deal with that. And we will here in just a second. That's going to be 5 pound inches per inch times then 144 inches quantity squared. That'll get divided by 2 and then we get the 191.1 .1 kip inch squared. And let's just take that times a thousand pounds per inch. And we will get then 5 times 144 squared divided by 2 divided by 191.1 divided by 1000. And we get a total angle of twist of 0.271 radians. Right, which isn't all that much. All right, there's two pi radians in a full circle. So what would that be? That would be times 180 divided by pi, 15.5 degrees of net rotation.